Chapter 11 Fluency Through Preparation Animis Apibusque Parati, Ready in Mind and Resources Motto of South Carolina In omnibus negotius prius quam agridier, adhibenda est preparatio diligence, in all matters before beginning a diligent preparation should be made. Cicero, De Officius Take your dictionary and look up the words that contain the Latin stem flu, the results will be suggestive. At first blush it would seem that fluency consists in a ready, easy use of words. Not so, the flowing quality of speech is much more, for it is a composite effect, with each of its prior conditions deserving of careful notice. The sources of fluency speaking broadly, fluency is almost entirely a matter of preparation. Certainly, native gifts figure largely here, as in every art, but even natural facility is dependent on the very same laws of preparation that hold good for the man of supposedly small native endowment. Let this encourage you if, like Moses, you are prone to complain that you are not a ready speaker. Have you ever stopped to analyze that expression, a ready speaker? Readiness, in its prime sense, is preparedness, and they are most ready who are best prepared. Quick firing depends more on the alert finger than on the hair trigger. Your fluency will be in direct ratio to two important conditions, your knowledge of what you are going to say, and your being accustomed to telling what you know to an audience. This gives us the second great element of fluency, to preparation must be added the ease that arises from practice, of which more presently. Knowledge is essential Mr. Bryan is a most fluent speaker when he speaks on political problems, tendencies of the time, and questions of morals. It is to be supposed, however, that he would not be so fluent in speaking on the bird life of the Florida Everglades. Mr. John Burroughs might be at his best on this last subject, yet entirely lost in talking about international law. Do not expect to speak fluently on a subject that you know little or nothing about. Tessaphon boasted that he could speak all day, a sin in itself, on any subject that an audience would suggest. He was banished by the Spartans. But preparation goes beyond the getting of the facts in the case you are to present, it includes also the ability to think and arrange your thoughts, a full and precise vocabulary, an easy manner of speech and breathing, absence of self-consciousness, and the several other characteristics of efficient delivery that have deserved special attention in other parts of this book rather than in this chapter. Preparation may be either general or specific, usually it should be both. A lifetime of reading, of companionship with stirring thoughts, of wrestling with the problems of life, this constitutes a general preparation of inestimable worth. Out of a well-stored mind, and, richer still, a broad experience, and, best of all, a warmly sympathetic heart, the speaker will have to draw much material that no immediate study could provide. General preparation consists of all that a man has put into himself, all that heredity and environment have instilled into him, and, that other rich source of preparedness for speech, the friendship of wise companions. When Schiller returned home after a visit with Goethe a friend remarked, I am amazed by the progress Schiller can make within a single fortnight. It was the progressive influence of a new friendship. Proper friendships form one of the best means for the formation of ideas and ideals, for they enable one to practice in giving expression to thought. The speaker who would speak fluently before an audience should learn to speak fluently and entertainingly with a friend. Clarify your ideas by putting them in words, the talker gains as much from his conversation as the listener. You sometimes begin to converse on a subject thinking you have very little to say, but one idea gives birth to another, and you are surprised to learn that the more you give the more you have to give. This give and take of friendly conversation develops mentality and fluency in expression. Longfellow said, A single conversation across the table with a wise man is better than ten years' study of books, and Holmes whimsically yet none the less truthfully declared that half the time he talked to find out what he thought. But that method must not be applied on the platform. After all this enrichment of life by storage, must come the special preparation for the particular speech. This is of so definite a sort that it warrants separate chapter treatment later. 
Practice but preparation must also be of another sort than the gathering, organizing, and shaping of materials, it must include practice, which, like mental preparation, must be both general and special. Do not feel surprised or discouraged if practice on the principles of delivery herein laid down seems to retard your fluency. For a time, this will be inevitable. While you are working for proper inflection, for instance, inflection will be demanding your first thoughts, and the flow of your speech, for the time being, will be secondary. This warning, however, is strictly for the closet, for your practice at home. Do not carry any thoughts of inflection with you to the platform. There you must think only of your subject. There is an absolute telepathy between the audience and the speaker. If your thought goes to your gesture, their thought will too. If your interest goes to the quality of your voice, they will be regarding that instead of what your voice is uttering. You have doubtless been adjured to forget everything but your subject. This advice says either too much or too little. The truth is that while on the platform you must not forget a great many things that are not in your subject, but you must not think of them. Your attention must consciously go only to your message, but subconsciously you will be attending to the points of technique which have become more or less habitual by practice. A nice balance between these two kinds of attention is important. You can no more escape this law than you can live without air, your platform gestures, your voice, your inflection, will all be just as good as your habit of gesture, voice, and inflection makes them, no better. Even the thought of whether you are speaking fluently or not will have the effect of marring your flow of speech. Return to the opening chapter, on self-confidence, and again lay its precepts to heart. Learn by rules to speak without thinking of rules. It is not, or ought not to be, necessary for you to stop to think how to say the alphabet correctly, as a matter of fact it is slightly more difficult for you to repeat Z, Y, X than it is to say X, Y, Z, habit has established the order. Just so you must master the laws of efficiency in speaking until it is a second nature for you to speak correctly rather than otherwise. A beginner at the piano has a great deal of trouble with the mechanics of playing, but as time goes on his fingers become trained and almost instinctively wander over the keys correctly. As an inexperienced speaker you will find a great deal of difficulty at first in putting principles into practice, for you will be scared, like the young swimmer, and make some crude strokes, but if you persevere you will, win out. Thus, to sum up, the vocabulary you have enlarged by study, for, the ease in speaking you have developed by practice, the economy of your well-studied emphasis all will subconsciously come to your aid on the platform. Then the habits you have formed will be earning you a splendid dividend. The fluency of your speech will be at the speed of flow your practice has made habitual. But this means work. What good habit does not? No philosopher's stone that will act as a substitute for laborious practice has ever been found. If it were, it would be thrown away, because it would kill our greatest joy, the delight of acquisition. If public speaking means to you a fuller life, you will know no greater happiness than a well-spoken speech. The time you have spent in gathering ideas and in private practice of speaking you will find amply rewarded. Questions and Exercises 1. What advantages has the fluent speaker over the hesitating talker? 2. What influences, within and without the man himself, work against fluency? 3. Select from the daily paper some topic for an address and make a three-minute address on it. Do your words come freely and your sentences flow out rhythmically? Practice on the same topic until they do. 4. Select some subject with which you are familiar and test your fluency by speaking extemporaneously. 5. Take one of the sentiments given below and, following the advice given on pages 118 to 119, construct a short speech beginning with the last word in the sentence. Machinery has created a new economic world. The Socialist Party is a strenuous worker for peace. He was a crushed and broken man when he left prison. War must ultimately give way to worldwide arbitration. The labor unions demand a more equal distribution of the wealth that labor creates. 6. Put the sentiments of Mr. Bryan's, Prince of Peace, 
on page 448, into your own words. Honestly criticize your own effort. 7. Take any of the following quotations and make a 5-minute speech on it without pausing to prepare. The first efforts may be very lame, but if you want speed on a typewriter, a record for a 100-yard dash, or facility in speaking, you must practice, practice, practice. There lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds. Tennyson, Indiana Memoriam How it be, it seems to me, tis only noble to be good. Kind hearts are more than coronets, and simple faith than Norman blood. Tennyson, Lady Clara Vere de Vere. Tis distance lends enchantment to the view and robes the mountain in its azure hue. Campbell, Pleasures of Hope. His best companions, innocence and health, and his best riches, ignorance of wealth. Goldsmith, The Deserted Village. Beware of desperate steps. The darkest day, live till tomorrow, will have passed away. Cooper, Needless Alarm. My country is the world, and my religion is to do good. Pain, rights of man trade it may help, society extend, but lures the pirate, and corrupts the friend, it raises armies in a nation's aid, but bribes a senate, and the lands betrayed. Pope, Moral Essays, 5, O oh God, that men should put an enemy in their mouths to steal away their brains. Shakespeare, Othello. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Henley, Invictus. The world is so full of a number of things, I am sure we should all be happy as kings. Stevenson, A Child's Garden of Verses. If your morals are dreary, depend upon it they are wrong. Stevenson, Essays. Every advantage has its tax. I learn to be content. Emerson, Essays. 8. Make a two-minute speech on any of the following general subjects, but you will find that your ideas will come more readily if you narrow your subject by taking some specific phase of it. For instance, instead of trying to speak on law, in general, take the proposition, the poor man cannot afford to prosecute, or instead of dwelling on leisure, show how modern speed is creating more leisure. In this way you may expand this subject list indefinitely. General Themes Law Politics Woman's Suffrage Initiative and Referendum A Larger Navy War Peace Foreign Immigration The Liquor Traffic Labor Unions Strikes Socialism Single Tax Tariff. Honesty. Courage. Hope. Love. Mercy. Kindness. Justice. Progress. Machinery. Invention. Wealth. Poverty. Agriculture. Science. Surgery. Haste. Leisure. Happiness. Health. Business. America. The Far East. Mobs. Colleges. Sports. Matrimony. Divorce. Child labor. Education. Books. The theater. Literature. Electricity. Achievement. Failure. Public speaking. Ideals. Conversation. The most dramatic moment of my life. My happiest days. Things worthwhile. What I hope to achieve. My greatest desire. What I would do with a million dollars. Is mankind progressing? Our greatest need. Footnotes. 4. See chapter on, increasing the vocabulary. 5. Money. Chapter 12. The Voice. Oh, there is something in that voice that reaches the innermost recesses of my spirit. Longfellow, Christus. The dramatic critic of the London Times once declared that acting is nine-tenths voice work. 
Leaving the message aside, the same may justly be said of public speaking. A rich, correctly used voice is the greatest physical factor of persuasiveness and power, often overtopping the effects of reason. But a good voice, well handled, is not only an effective possession for the professional speaker, it is a mark of personal culture as well, and even a distinct commercial asset. Gladstone, himself the possessor of a deep, musical voice, has said, 90 men in every hundred in the crowded professions will probably never rise above mediocrity because the training of the voice is entirely neglected and considered of no importance. These are words worth pondering. There are three fundamental requisites for a good voice. 1. E. Senior Bonsi of the Metropolitan Opera Company says that the secret of good voice is relaxation, and this is true, for relaxation is the basis of ease. The air waves that produce voice result in a different kind of tone when striking against relaxed muscles than when striking constricted muscles. Try this for yourself. Contract the muscles of your face and throat as you do in hate, and flame out, I hate you. Now relax as you do when thinking gentle, tender thoughts, and say, I love you. How different the voice sounds. In practicing voice exercises, and in speaking, never force your tones. Ease must be your watchword. The voice is a delicate instrument, and you must not handle it with hammer and tongs. Don't make your voice go, let it go. Don't work. Let the yoke of speech be easy and its burden light. Your throat should be free from strain during speech, therefore it is necessary to avoid muscular contraction. The throat must act as a sort of chimney or funnel for the voice, hence any unnatural constriction will not only harm its tones but injure its health. Nervousness and mental strain are common sources of mouth and throat constriction, so make the battle for poise and self-confidence for which we pleaded in the opening chapter. But how can I relax? You ask. By simply willing to relax. Hold your arm out straight from your shoulder. Now, withdraw all power and let it fall. Practice relaxation of the muscles of the throat by letting your neck and head fall forward. Roll the upper part of your body around, with the waistline acting as a pivot. Let your head fall and roll around as you shift the torso to different positions. Do not force your head around, simply relax your neck and let gravity pull it around as your body moves. Again, let your head fall forward on your breast, raise your head, letting your jaw hang. Relax until your jaw feels heavy, as though it were a weight hung to your face. Remember, you must relax the jaw to obtain command of it. It must be free and flexible for the molding of tone, and to let the tone pass out unobstructed. The lips also must be made flexible, to aid in the molding of clear and beautiful tones. For flexibility of lips repeat the syllables, M-O, me. In saying M-O, bring the lips up to resemble the shape of the letter O. In repeating me draw them back as you do in a grin. Repeat this exercise rapidly, giving the lips as much exercise as possible. Try the following exercise in the same manner, M-O, E. O, E, O, O, Ah. After this exercise has been mastered, the following will also be found excellent for flexibility of lips. Memorize these sounds indicated, not the expressions, so that you can repeat them rapidly. A as in May. E as in Met. U as in Use. A, uh, Ah. I, I soy Oil. A, uh, At. I, It, You, Our. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, ooze. Uh, all. Oh, oh, foot. Uh, ah. E, eat. Oh, oh, ooze. E, eat. All the activity of breathing must be centered, not in the throat, but in the middle of the body, you must breathe from the diaphragm. Note the way you breathe when lying flat on the back, undressed in bed. You will observe that all the activity then centers around the diaphragm. This is the natural and correct method of breathing. By constant watchfulness make this your habitual manner, for it will enable you to relax more perfectly the muscles of the throat.
The next fundamental requisite for good voice is to Openness if the muscles of the throat are constricted, the tone passage partially closed, and the mouth kept half shut, how can you expect the tone to come out bright and clear, or even to come out at all? Sound is a series of waves, and if you make a prison of your mouth, holding the jaws and lips rigidly, it will be very difficult for the tone to squeeze through, and even when it does escape it will lack force and carrying power. Open your mouth wide, relax all the organs of speech, and let the tone flow out easily. Start to yawn, but instead of yawning, speak while your throat is open. Make this open feeling habitual when speaking, we say make because it is a matter of resolution and of practice, if your vocal organs are healthy. Your tone passages may be partly closed by enlarged tonsils, adenoids, or enlarged turbinate bones of the nose. If so, a skilled physician should be consulted. The nose is an important tone passage and should be kept open and free for perfect tones. What we call, talking through the nose, is not talking through the nose, as you can easily demonstrate by holding your nose as you talk. If you are bothered with nasal tones caused by growths or swellings in the nasal passages, a slight, painless operation will remove the obstruction. This is quite important, aside from voice, for the general health will be much lowered if the lungs are continually starved for air. The final fundamental requisite for good voice is three. Forwardness A voice that is pitched back in the throat is dark, somber, and unattractive. The tone must be pitched forward, but do not force it forward. You will recall that our first principle was ease. Think the tone forward and out. Believe it is going forward, and allow it to flow easily. You can tell whether you are placing your tone forward or not by inhaling a deep breath and singing ah with the mouth wide open, trying to feel the little delicate sound waves strike the bony arch of the mouth just above the front teeth. The sensation is so slight that you will probably not be able to detect it at once, but persevere in your practice, always thinking the tone forward, and you will be rewarded by feeling your voice strike the roof of your mouth. A correct forward placing of the tone will do away with the dark, throaty tones that are so unpleasant, inefficient, and harmful to the throat. Close the lips, humming ying, im, or in. Think the tone forward. Do you feel it strike the lips? Hold the palm of your hand in front of your face and say vigorously crash, dash, whirl, buzz. Can you feel the forward tone strike against your hand? Practice until you can. Remember, the only way to get your voice forward is to put it forward. How to develop the carrying power of the voice It is not necessary to speak loudly in order to be heard at a distance. It is necessary only to speak correctly. Edith Wynne Matheson's voice will carry in a whisper throughout a large theater. A paper rustling on the stage of a large auditorium can be heard distinctly in the furthermost seat in the gallery. If you will only use your voice correctly, you will not have much difficulty in being heard. Of course it is always well to address your speech to your furthest auditors, if they get it, those nearer will have no trouble, but aside from this obvious suggestion, you must observe these laws of voice production, remember to apply the principles of ease, openness, and forwardness, they are the prime factors in enabling your voice to be heard at a distance. Do not gaze at the floor as you talk. This habit not only gives the speaker an amateurish appearance, but if the head is hung forward the voice will be directed towards the ground instead of floating out over the audience. Voice is a series of air vibrations. To strengthen it two things are necessary, more air or breath, and more vibration. Breath is the very basis of voice. As a bullet with little powder behind it will not have force and carrying power, so the voice that has little breath behind it will be weak. Not only will deep breathing, breathing from the diaphragm, give the voice a better support, but it will give it a stronger resonance by improving the general health. Usually, ill health means a weak voice, while abundant physical vitality is shown through a strong, vibrant voice. Therefore anything that improves the general vitality is an excellent voice strengthener, provided you use the voice properly. Authorities differ on most of the rules of hygiene but on one point they all agree, vitality and longevity are increased by deep breathing. 
Practice this until it becomes second nature. Whenever you are speaking, take in deep breaths, but in such a manner that the inhalations will be silent. Do not try to speak too long without renewing your breath. Nature cares for this pretty well unconsciously in conversation, and she will do the same for you in platform speaking if you do not interfere with her premonitions. A certain very successful speaker developed voice carrying power by running across country, practicing his speeches as he went. The vigorous exercise forced him to take deep breaths and developed lung power. A hard fought basketball or tennis game is an efficient way of practicing deep breathing. When these methods are not convenient, we recommend the following, place your hands at your sides, on the waistline. By trying to encompass your waist with your fingers and thumbs, force all the air out of the lungs. Take a deep breath. Remember, all the activity is to be centered in the middle of the body, do not raise the shoulders. As the breath is taken your hands will be forced out. Repeat the exercise, placing your hands on the small of the back and forcing them out as you inhale. Many methods for deep breathing have been given by various authorities. Get the air into your lungs, that is the important thing. The body acts as a sounding board for the voice just as the body of the violin acts as a sounding board for its tones. You can increase its vibrations by practice. Place your finger on your lip and hum the musical scale, thinking and placing the voice forward on the lips. Do you feel the lips vibrate? After a little practice they will vibrate, giving a tickling sensation. Repeat this exercise, throwing the humming sound into the nose. Hold the upper part of the nose between the thumb and forefinger. Can you feel the nose vibrate? Placing the palm of your hand on top of your head, Repeat this humming exercise. Think the voice there as you hum in head tones. Can you feel the vibration there? Now place the palm of your hand on the back of your head, repeating the foregoing process. Then try it on the chest. Always remember to think your tone where you desire to feel the vibrations. The mere act of thinking about any portion of your body will tend to make it vibrate. Repeat the following. After a deep inhalation, endeavoring to feel all portions of your body vibrate at the same time. When you have attained this you will find that it is a pleasant sensation. What ho, my jovial mates! Come on! We will frolic it like fairies, frisking in the merry moonshine. Purity of voice this quality is sometimes destroyed by wasting the breath. Carefully control the breath using only as much as is necessary for the production of tone. Utilize all that you give out. Failure to do this results in a breathy tone. Take in breath like a prodigal, in speaking, give it out like a miser. Voice suggestions never attempt to force your voice when hoarse. Do not drink cold water when speaking. The sudden shock to the heated organs of speech will injure the voice. Avoid pitching your voice too high, it will make it raspy. This is a common fault. When you find your voice in too high a range, lower it. Do not wait until you get to the platform to try this. Practice it in your daily conversation. Repeat the alphabet, beginning A on the lowest scale possible and going up a note on each succeeding letter, for the development of range. A wide range will give you facility in making numerous changes of pitch. Do not form the habit of listening to your voice when speaking. You will need your brain to think of what you are saying, reserve your observation for private practice. Questions and Exercises 1. What are the prime requisites for good voice? 2. Tell why each one is necessary for good voice production. 3. Give some exercises for development of these conditions. 4. Why is range of voice desirable? 5. Tell how range of voice may be cultivated. 6. How much daily practice do you consider necessary for the proper development of your voice? 7. How can resonance and carrying power be developed? 8. What are your voice faults? 9. How are you trying to correct them?